Sir Ian Lavacek from Multimodal Safety and Design Branch. Thank you, Sahar. Thank you all for joining me again and, and sticking around through lunch. I've all got a quick bite to eat. So I will be talking about Chapter 17 and the changes we're making this year. Chapter 17 is our Pedestrian, Bicycle and Transit Design Requirements Chapter. This is not a new chapter, uh, but we have made a number of changes throughout it. As an overview, we have slightly restructured the chapter. It's broken up into five sections. We have an overview section for um, general requirements for all of them. Well, an overview of the chapter. Section two is our general requirements um, throughout that cover everything. Section three is pedestrian focused, four is bikeway focused, and five is transit focused. Like I mentioned before, we are not the transit agency and Metro has their own design guidelines, but we really try to focus on, and this chapter is uh, where uh, the, the kinds of uh, requirements that we would uh, require for transit facilities in our right of way. So it doesn't cover everything for transit. Section one is our overview uh, section. We have added a number of different definitions uh, in this section. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them, but I will touch on a couple of the design standards that go with some of these. You'll notice that a lot of these were not defined previously, um, but over the five years since we last did a chapter, a major chapter 17 overhaul, uh, we've been doing a lot of different kind of multimodal bicycle, pedestrian, and even transit infrastructure around town. And it was time for us to standardize some of them so that, that our infrastructure is looking this, the same way as, as multiple agencies and design firms work on these uh, pieces of infrastructure. Section two is our general requirements for everything. Um, there are, our major change that we want to highlight here is not necessarily a new standard, but it's providing very clear directions for how we want to handle uh, temporary traffic control for pedestrian bicycle and, uh, and transit tra uh, traffic as well. Um, that we really want to provide this this kind of consistent fl flow chart for um, if a construction project, uh, no matter what it is, if it's if it's impacting this infrastructure, we'd like first to try to maintain existing paths and protect users, understanding that vulnerable road users like people who are walking or in a wheelchair really need to have the least direct uh, detour possible, especially in, in Houston's sometimes hostile weather. Um, so if we can maintain their existing path, that is frequently the by far the most desirable. And only if that's not possible will we look at providing nearby di diversions. And the last case is is what we see right now is probably the first case. And we want to see this less and less where we provide long detours, um, long detours for people walking, biking, using transit, maybe several blocks away. Um, and that, that can be very hostile for walking and biking in, in the city. And so we'd really like to avoid that whenever possible. For section three, uh, this I think we did rearrange this a little bit. Um, I, we, we wanted to move pedestrian requirements earlier in the chapter because they impact just about every project, uh, whereas bikeways and transit are a little more specific. A lot of the requirements in, in, in this section are not new. However, we have provided much more clarity for the kinds of uh, uh, um, ADA kind of infrastructure, curb ramps, um, um, wheelchair ramps, how we really want those to look whenever possible. Um, so for example, where we are we are no longer supporting the kind of non-directional ramps uh, that you see on the far right of the screen that point perhaps a, a, a person who is blind, uh, they might not have any indication that they're being pointed directly into the middle of the intersection. Uh, best practice and now our standard is to provide more directional kinds of curb ramps that, do, that, that direct all pedestrians, but most critically blind pedestrians in the direction of safe travel. That can look like on the on the far left uh, where um, um, where we have, you know, we're showing the signal kinds of uh, considerations here. We, we definitely want to also provide pedestrian push buttons right next to level landings wherever possible. Uh, we know that a lot of these design criteria are not going to be able to be met every single time. And in this chapter, uh, we are not necessarily looking for variances every time, but we have provided a lot of specifications for when we think uh, these kinds of treatments are feasible um, and, and under what kinds of scopes of projects. So I say that again, we're, we're not looking for small scope projects 
um, to make lots of changes out there, but larger scale projects, we might look for uh, meeting these standards. Um, only really are we looking for a variance where that kind of diagonal ramp is, is the only way we can move forward. Uh, another, I, I mentioned this in the multimodal service standards, this idea of curb extensions. Um, that's what we're calling this piece of infrastructure. That's also known as bulb outs. Really, there's nothing nothing special about it. It's just how you think about positioning the curbs at intersections. And these are frequently most useful where you have dedicated on-street parking and where you might legally not be able to park close to the intersection. What we are providing the standard for is just don't let people park there. Push out the curbs, basically extend the curb out so that people can't park there. Um, that's basically all we're saying. We do have a formula we, we provided to, to try to standardize that and provide that guidance for where that is really going to be useful. Um, but this is not necessarily looking at reducing capacity. This is really formalizing the legal use of the street. And what that allows us to do is provide a much uh, shorter crossing distance for people who are walking, which can be very beneficial to pedestrian travel. Um, another, uh, this is a new standard, although we've been developing it over many years and, and many of our consultant uh, friends who have been using have already already been familiar with this process. Uh, basically where we have a project um, and somebody may, and this, this could apply to anybody where uh, we want to look at an enhanced pedestrian or bicycle crossing of the street. This could be something like somebody's requesting a new marked crosswalk and and the, the typical, uh, we, we typically in the past would just look at the standard, show us the pedestrians are crossing there. What we acknowledged is that we have lots of streets where people need to cross and, and you're not going to be able to get a large number of pedestrians crossing just because it's so hostile to them. So we're providing very clear guidance for where safe crossings can exist. Um, and, and so what we're looking for on, on projects is that even if we're only looking at one crossing, we want to plan out the whole corridor to understand where the other crossings could be because we want to make sure that we're hitting the high marks. We're, we're, we're really many, wanting to make sure that assuming that we're having a safe space uh, crossing every 500 to 720 feet, we want to make sure we're hitting these kinds of things on the right, such as a busy trail crossing. We know we need a crossing for a trail. Uh, if there's a bus transit stop, if it's on the Houston bike plan or if there's schools, churches, parks, other significant pedestrian generators, we like to, before we even approve one crossing, we like to understand what's the context of the corridor, what are all the things that people may be wanting to cross the street to get to. And so we have a process for defining how we def uh, how we identify those locations um, um, and, and then space them out. And then so it's a kind of a two part thing. The first part is defining where crossings are are acceptable. It's kind of the where. And then the second part of it is the what. What do those crossings need to look like to provide a safe crossing? For somebody to cross to that location, and um, our, we've defined this methodology. Um, this uh, that basically uses the highway capacity me method manual methodology for pedestrian level of service at unsignalized locations to define a treatment that'll achieve a pedestrian level of service of E um, and a pedestrian delay of less than 30 seconds for all hours of the day. We want we want to look for the simplest option um, that can be used with that achieve those metrics. And, and then we want to look at all the options that could be feasible, whether that could be curb extensions or if we have if we have more lanes and the volumes required, perhaps we can reduce the crossing distance. We want to consider all of these things um, and then we can come to a uh, with a with a very well thought out um, um, decision at the very end of, of it. Um, those those highway capacity manual calculations can lead us to, like I said, lots of different kinds of, of, of feasible treatments. These can be something as simple as a high visibility high visibility crosswalk and signs. We also have standards now defined for raised crossings that could be appropriate in some locations. We um, of course have curb extensions, a median refuge islands, our pedestrian refuge islands shown in the bottom right there. We're seeing more and more of those. That, def that break up the pedestrian crossing movement across the street into two phases. Uh, we, we've anecdotally seen the yield rates in these situations uh, go through the roof. Um, so a lot of these things don't require a lot of maintenance, um, but they can, they can dramatically improve the pedestrian experience. And then we can also use this methodology to start warranting a re rectangular rapid flash beacons or RRBs or pedestrian hybrid beacon, also known as PHBs or HOCs. It's kind of the old terminology for them. So this whole framework, this is a multi-page new section um, in Chapter 17 that will helpfully define a very standard way of approving these, these metrics. 
um, that is usually using highway capacity manual, MUTCD, and other guide guidance uh, for how we do that. And here's another one of my QR codes. Uh, I think we're going to share this one in in, in our Q and A because I think some people missed the last one. Um, we'll be doing a, another webinar for this as well because it is so nuanced. Um, but but we think this is uh, we, we've seen people already doing this. And now we very sta standardize it. So we'll walk through a couple of examples of what this could look like and how we're approving these kinds of measures. So again, that webinar will be on April 24th. That'll be I think the week after that one I previously talked about. This will be specifically focused on pedestrian corridor crossing analysis, basically what I just talked about. You can register at this link or scan the QR code. OK, moving on to section four, which is our bikeway uh, facility requirements. This is a um, this we have reworked some of the standards within this chapter, basically using best guidance for how to make the choice um, for what kinds of bikeway is appropriate given the traffic volumes and speeds. Um, this this provide this ensures that we have um, um, safe and high comfort bike facilities that uh, most people will feel safe and comfortable using. Um, that is very much what this chart is all about. It's much ali aligned with the previous uh, chart that was in in this chapter, but we feel that it is most more based on best practice now as the as that evolves. We've defined a number of different. Uh, we basically have a scale of uh, comfort, and and depending on the context of the roadways, we're giving guidance for which one of these kinds of treatments could be appropriate to achieve in all ages and all abilities user of the roadway. Um, when we're thinking about bikeways, we really want to make sure that it's something that everybody who wants to be able to use it feels like they safely can do and they can do it with their kids or they can do it if, if they're they're elderly. Um, and, and so we're providing guidance for if it's a shared use path, if it's a dedicated bike path, um, ra raised bike lane where the bike lane might be a little bit raised from the road, but not at the same level as the sidewalk. We have guidance for where a bi-directional protected bike lane might work where a single direction protected bike lane might work. And then uh, last but not least, on very low volume, low speed streets, a neighborhood bikeway that uh, just has markings and maybe some other treatments might be acceptable. Um, these are the same kinds of facilities we've provided a lot of. Um, we know we haven't seen a lot of these in Houston, although we're seeing more and more of them. Um, but as people um, are, are in situations where they might have the ability to design more of these, we want to give them more insight into how these could actually look and how they can function. Uh, we don't necessarily have um, uh, uh, well basically we have we have uh, um, we, we talk about each one of these in the chapter so again these are the same facilities as outlined before um, one thing you'll note is that we don't specifically call out uh, simple striped bike lanes what we are finding that the old-fashioned kind of bike lane that is just defined by defined by a stripe um, either does is not comfortable and safe on the on a major road or if it's on a street that you could just have that if it's if it's a quiet enough street with low enough traffic volumes and speed, you might not even need the markings. So for the most part, we're we're finding that that kind of treatment is not really needed anywhere. We'd like to really stick to our our main uh, set of design guidelines. We've given a little bit more thought uh, to how bikeways work at intersections. Intersections are some of the most complicated for people walking and biking. And, and driving for what it's worth. And for a cyclist trying to make mo uh, mo uh, movements across the intersection, uh, we've given a lot of thought about what are the kinds of treatments that might be acceptable. And so we, we've, we've provided uh, guidance that we really would like to try to see more of these protected intersection treatments. We have a couple of them around town. These are most effective in a, in a complete rebuild, although we've seen them used effectively in retrofits as well. Basically the idea is to pull out cyclist traffic out of the street, away from vehicle traffic, into um, and so their movements are very clearly defined. But we also have guidance for green two stage Q boxes and green uh, bike boxes as well. We have fleshed out quite a bit more about what bicycle parking can look like and where we want to see bicycle parking in, in roadway projects. Um, basically, uh, this is such a critical part of making sure bike, bike facilities are effective for the community. Um, people can't bike somewhere if they can't park their bicycle. And we've identified a number of different ways that bike parking can be provided in a way that the city can maintain. Um, and we give guidance for where those can be 
And we have a new standard detail that we'll talk about later that that really provides just a simple kind of U bike rack um, that we're ready to maintain. We also introduced concepts such as bike corrals, which you can see an example of in the top right uh, that, that may in certain situations be able to use on street parking or could actually act come something like the curb extension, basically where somebody couldn't park a vehicle legally, uh, you could probably still provide bicycle parking uh, and, and take advantage of a space that wouldn't otherwise be used. Provide a lot more information about what bike wayfinding looks like. Um, on, on the right uh, is, is our Houston bikeway signage that we've been using on bikeways that are all ages and abilities that we've designed according to current standards. Basically, we like to use this uh, to, to signify that if a cyclist is using a bike facility along one of these routes that are signed like this, they know they can continue with that approximate same level of comfort until the signs end. Um, and we also like to use uh, more of the wayfinding signage, which is just standard MUT, MUTCD signage uh, for giving guidance for how far major destinations are. Last but not least, a couple of our transit facility changes or requirements. Uh, the, the focus mainly has been on how uh, this year we add a lot more guidance for how you can interface bicycle facilities with transit infrastructure, um, such as a uh, one of the, the classic uh, challenges for a cyclist on a major street is when a bus um, 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 stops and for a bus stop and a cyclist may pass them up. And then then the, when the bus proceeds again, they pass up the cyclist. So it's just, it's just an ev never ending game of leapfrog, which is not comfortable for the bus driver or for the cyclist. And so these kinds of bus uh, floating bus stops can be very effective for separating out, separating out those movements and really defining how transit riders board and alight uh, from the buses and cross the um, bicycle infrastructure. We do have a new standard detail that shows some very core elements of the floating bus stops. What we have found is basically every situation is going to be a little bit different and that's OK. Um, and, and we provided some guidance here about the kinds of things that could be acceptable. With the goal being that we don't want the bicycle vehicle, the bicycle as a vehicle interacting with the bus vehicle. Um, but if we can if we can have interacting with the pedestrians on the bus, the bus riders and the cyclists, that could be happening at a much safer speed. And that is all for the major changes in Chapter 17. We'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ian. Uh, before answering uh, some of the questions, um, Actually, uh, we'll skip to the questions right now. Um, for a crossing treatment, is the steel covered plate slip resistant? We let me get back to you on that. Our primary, um, I believe that is in, uh, the intention. The primary idea for the the crossing uh, for the steel culvert plate, and I'll, I'll say first of all that the steel crossing plate that is for these kinds of things such as uh, 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 they could be a curb extension, they could be a floating bus stop. Basically, whenever we're pushing out something away from the curb, but you still have to maintain the gutter flow line, you have to use this kind of steel culvert plate. Um, we, we are seeing them used pretty effectively, um, although we have defined some standards that provide a little bit more width for the gutter. Um, and then the steel plate, we also want to make sure that it's removable for maintenance so that, that, our, that our gutter teams can clean it out. Um, I'll have to check to see if we have actually added that slip resistance. I think that's the intention. OK, next question is, are there special slash different requirements for sidewalk width in the presence of protected protected bike lanes? That will depend a little bit on the context. Um, it'll depend. So for example, we'll have a bike facility that we call a shared use path. Um, and in this situation, the, the bike bikeway and the sidewalk are mixed together. And this can be appropriate in, in places where um, maybe your, your bike traffic is not heavy, it's not expected to be heavy, or the pedestrian traffic is not particularly heavy. Um, the concern is that, that eventually one or both of those might be heavy. So we'd like to avoid the shared use paths where, where possible, but they, they can be allowable in, in many situations. And in that case, in the sidewalk width is incorporated and, and is, is covered by that. Um, in other situations, the um, where the bicycle facility is maybe next to the sidewalk, maybe at the same level as the sidewalk, the sidewalk at that point will have to, have to operate according to its own standards. So this will not make any modifications to the standards for that sidewalk, um, and they'll have to maintain the sidewalks independently. Thank you, Ian. 
and that so that be a lot of time for questions. Again, if we didn't get to your questions, we will answer them later on. And our next presenter is Mr. Gilbert Portillo from the Office of City Engineer, Water and Wastewater, Telecommunications, Permits, and Plan Review. Gilbert will be presenting changes made to Chapter 18, which is the encroachment requirements. Thanks, Jose, again. Um, good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, I would like to, again, thank everyone who worked to complete all these revisions. Um, I will be briefing everyone on our brand new chapter, uh, Chapter 18 to the IDM, which pertains to encroachment requirements in the public right-of-way. Um, most of the information was previously in Chapter 16 that captured miscellaneous items. However, as I previously mentioned and presented, uh, this is now exclusive. That is now exclusively for communication facilities. Um, well, as I mentioned, this new chapter is entitled Encroachment Requirements. Um, starting with the table of contents, this chapter is divided into two main sections. The first section is an overview of encroachment requirements, which includes references and definitions. The second section is regarding encroachment permit requirements. This section includes general and special encroachment permit requirements, how to submit for encroachment permits, and quality assurance. Um, I did want to emphasize that this chapter only covers encroachment requirements in the public right-of-way and not in public easements. All encroachments in the public right-of-way follow certain sections within Chapter 40 of the City of Houston Code of Ordinances. We now move on to the definition section. While most of the definitions that apply to encroachment requirements from the former Chapter 16 were transferred over to this new chapter, uh, the city did add two new definitions and they appear as red lines on your screen. The first one is encroachments. So um, encroachments was defined to com uh, confirm with the city's interpretation and to better align with the encroachment permit applications and overall enforcement. Um, so basically any private use into, upon, over, or under the city's public right-of-way will require some sort of encroachment permit with the Office of the City Engineer in Houston Public Works. Facility was also added and it was defined to align with our ordinances and our encroachment permit application for our monitoring well program, which is designated by the City of Houston to administer and enforce city ordinances pertaining to the construction, alteration, maintenance, and destruction of monitoring wells and environmental so soil borings within the city's public right-of-way. We now move on to section two, uh, which covers the encroachment permit requirements. The general encroachment permit requirements is simply a link to the permitting center's website in case future updates are made, and it directs you to our standard right-of-way encroachment permit application. The special encroachment permit requirements cover residential subdivision markers, sky bridges, and monitoring wells and environmental test boring facilities, with the latter being a new addition to this chapter in the IDM, and the first two almost entirely the same and simply just transferred from the previous chapter 16. As I mentioned, monitoring wells and environmental test boring facilities design requirements were added to this chapter. This was to ensure these requirements are standardized and that the city design requirements for these facilities are clear to the public. Submittal requirements for encroachment permits had certain parts from the previous Chapter 16 transferred over, but was reorganized to emphasize the submittal procedures of the three main encroachment permits submitted to the Office of the City Engineer. The first one is general permits. A link for the general encroachment permit was added and the requirement of an approval letter from the Parks Department has been included for encroachments that include landscaping. The second one is subdivision markers. Similarly, links to the application and permit applications were added. We wanted to emphasize that subdivision markers with an esplanade require approval from the Parks Department under their Adopt an Esplanade program. The third one is monitoring wells and environmental test boring facilities. All these procedures are brand new, but follow the same format as the previous two sections. 
The last section that was added was for quality assurance, as all drawings will need to be de designed and signed by a licensed professional engineer. That concludes the information on our new chapter 18 regarding encroachment requirements in the 2023 edition of the IDM. Thank you so much for your time again. Um, if anyone has any questions on this chapter, uh, please ask those questions in the chat box. Thank you, Gilbert. Before answering questions from attendees, I'm going to ask a few frequently asked questions. So first question is, do I need to follow these requirements uh, if I'm proposing a patio in the right of way for a restaurant? Um, yes, uh, any private use into, upon, under, and in this case, over the city's right of way is, is considered an encroachment, so they must follow these requirements. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, who can submit an encroachment permit? Well, um, each encroachment permit has certain requirements and qualifications, so you have to refer to the general or special encroachment permits for specific details, but in general, anyone can apply. Next question, if uh, HOA wants to replace their existing subdivision marker, do they have to submit for an encroachment permit? Um, so our answer is yes. Uh, subdivision markers located within the public right of way require an encroachment permit per city ordinance since December of 2008. So if there's not an existing permit, you'll have to apply for a new one to replace it. Um, Houston Public Works has a special encroachment permit application for subdivision markers. Great, uh, thank you, Gilbert. So it seems that I haven't received any questions from the public at this time. Is there any major points that you want to highlight? Well, um, sure. Uh, right now we have uh, this new chapter really is to help us focus on all our encroachment processes. Um, as we move forward, um, hopefully this, this helps uh, answer any questions uh, the public has on what's considered an encroachment and how to apply for those. But um, I think it's pretty straightforward and exciting to have a chapter that um, encompasses all our encroachment requirements. Thank you so much. Uh, our next presenter is Mr. Jose Gutierrez from Office of City Engineer, Design and Construction Standards Group. Jose will present changes made to construction specifications. Good afternoon. I am Jose Gutierrez and I will be presenting what happened uh, through the construction specifications for the 2022 and 2023 uh, review cycle. You can find the specification red lines on the City of Houston Design and Construction Standards website. Under the Standard Review Committee tab and in the tab you can find in the general requirements and standards construction specification red lines from 2022 and the 2023 review cycle. Also, through 2021 and 2022, the standard specifications will remain online as a reference for the construction projects that are that were bid using those specifications. The link of those can be found under the construction specifications tab highlighted on the screen. Another thing to note is that you can also find the effective dates of the Division 1 and Division 2 specifications here um, on the screen as well and in this tab. Summary revisions, which is located on the first page of the standard specifications, can be referenced to keep track of changes made in each of the review cycle. Our intention is to keep these lists of the document for five years to supply a record of updates through one full five year review cycle for all of HPW specifications. But for right now, let's focus on the specifications. The specifications are broken down into three different categories. New specifications, specifications with updates, and lastly, retired specifications. In the next few slides, we'll be talking uh, about each of these categories. This year, we have three new specifications. 
Specification 2871, also known as the bike rack specification. Uh, this was added because there was no specification for bike racks and the drawing was created this review cycle. So to match the drawing, we created specifications for it. The next new specification is the pedestrian crosswalk system re rectangular rapid flashing beacon, the RRFB specification with the number of a 2890. And this is a new device which was proposed by Ashto for the right of way for mid block pedestrian crossings. Metro is proposing to use this on their boost projects, which is why this uh, specification was created. The last specification that was created this review cycle was the 16130 specification, also known as the Advanced Transportation Control Cabinet Assembly or the ATC Cabinet Assembly specification. This specification was created because the ITS cabinets are no longer industry standard and the new ATC specs was created. Now we'll be going over the retired specifications this review cycle. This review cycle consisted of six specifications that were retired. The 16734 WiMAX specification, the wireless communication specific system specification, also known as the 16738 specification, the code division multiple, multiple access modern assembly, the CDMA or the 17643 specification, the e Ethernet video MPEG 4 encoder and 4 decoder, which coincides with the 16744 and the 1645 specifications. Lastly, the 16751 or the wireless magnometer vehicle detection system. Now, these specifications were uh, retired because they were outdated and the city no longer uses their technologies. Now we'll be going through the specifications with major updates. Major updates means that the changes were made based on the review cycle coordination and the external comments. These are some of the Division 1 specifications with major updates. 1554, also known as the traffic control and street sign specifications, was updated. Now the payment clause states that reinstallation of existing signs is incidental to the work. This statement was on the standard details, but the, com the committee thought that it needed to be in the specification, so it was added. The 1555 specification, also known as the traffic control and regulation specification, was also updated uh, this review cycle. The major update to this was that the payment and requirements for water field barriers have been added to this specification, so you can find those there. The last major update to Division 1 spec is the 1582 specification, which is also known as the Build Houston Forward Project Identification Signs. Now, within this specification, bid price now has full compensation for picking up the sign from the shop, installing it, and maintaining and removing the sign for the duration of the project. This means that the responsibility of procurement and preparation has now been con uh, transferred to the contractor. Here are some of the Division 2 through 16 specifications with major updates. The 2221 specification, also known as the removing existing pavement structures, wood, and demolish demolition debris, uh, was updated this review cycle. Within the specification, the payment for removing and disposing of existing curb ramps was added. The next, next major updated specification was the 2582 spec, the traffic pole assembly steel specification. Here, you can find that the foundation is now incidental to the payment for different portions, such as traffic signal heads, pedestrian signal heads, and push buttons are now separate. The next specification that was updated was the concrete specification, which is a 2775 spec. The payment clause has been added or revised in this specification as well, which now includes the curb ramps. The traffic signal specification, which is a 2893, was also updated. 
The removal and salvage of traffic signals have been added to the payment clause. The hydro mulch seating specification, the 2921 payment uh, section has also been updated. Topsoil is now included and is not paid for separately. Now the uh, Division 16 specifications that have been updated this year. 16716 pedestrian signal heads. As I mentioned earlier, the countdown module, labor tools, equipment and incidentals have been included. 16719, the countdown pedestrian signal module. The payment shows that now that the, the countdown module is under specification of 16716. The last two specifications that had updates to the payment clauses are the 1733 and 1750, which is the field hardened Ethernet switch, as well as the accessible pedestrian push button station. Now, within the 16733 specification, which is included in the price of the work now, so now there's no separate line item for the work done for this uh, line item. And 16750 is now broken up into two different payments for the push button assemblies and the push button station control units. They used to be put together. That concludes this portion of the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Jose. Before answering questions from the attendees, I'm going to ask a few frequently asked questions. Were there any guide specifications updated this review cycle? The answer to that is no. Guide specifications are not reviewed by the standard review committee. Guide specs are instead maintained by the individual service lines within Houston Public Works. Okay. Uh, next frequently asked question. For capital projects, the 2023 specs have to be used even if the 60% submittal was prior to November 27, 2023? Yes, per document 700, the general conditions document, the latest edition of the standards at the time of bid must be used. Okay, and our last frequently asked question, where can I find a list of all the specifications that were updated during this review cycle? The list can be found in the executive summary of the IDM, and they can also be found in the beginning of the specifications PDF. Great, thank you, Jose. It doesn't look like we've received any Q and A's um, during this session. So thank you. Our next presenter is Sahar Begzadeh from the Office of a City Engineer Design and Construction Standards team. Sahar will present changes made to the standard details. Thank you, Mary. So various standard details associated with IDM chapters were up for review during the 2022-2023 review cycle. In this part of the webinar, I'm going to talk about two major topics, the changes that were made to standard details and the changes that were made to our website to create easier access and better environment for community to access our standard details. I'll start with standard details updates. Here is an overview of the standard details updates. In this review cycle, six standard details were created, three standard details were retired, and 43 standard details were subjected to technical updates. Also, numerous standard details were renumbered or retitled to match with the associated standard specification. Combined standard details were separated to provide ease of access and use of each detail and DWG format of standard details and their title blocks were standardized to match with the graphic requirements of Chapter 3 of IDM. And now they are available on our website for public use. New standard details. 
Six new standard details were provided to communicate requirements in Chapter 15 and Chapter 17 of IDM this year. You can see a list of new standard details in this slide. As you see, four details created in street and pavement category and two details created in traffic category. In this slide, you can see new standard details in a glance. Next, I'm going to talk about retired standard details. The three retired standard details were under general details category. These were the construction sign details that were used in rebuilt Houston projects. So since city has moved forward from rebuilt Houston to built Houston forward, these drawings were not required anymore by the city service lines. So these are retired. The first one is uh, 015 second one 015 and the third one is 015 6 Now I'm going to talk about technical updates. So several details were subject to technical updates this year. I'll go over the major changes that were made to standard details in this review cycle. First, uh, pedestrian real dimensions were removed from several standard details and the contractor was referred to contract drawings for pedestrian realm dimensions. Also, another important change was that uh, curb ramp so slopes were changed from 1 to 15 to 1 to 12 feet maximum to align with Chapter 17 requirements and ADA requirements. Uh, here I'm going to talk about technical updates in driveway standard details. Uh, sidewalk reinforcement information added to all driveway drawings, as you can see in Table 1. Driveway design criteria table added from Chapter 15 to show design requirements for different types of driveways. Three notes were added to the notes section. These are really important notes. According to notes, repair, reconstruction, or replacement of sidewalks shall meet permitting requirements of Section 40-552 of Code of Ordinances. Instructions added on repair or replacement of existing sidewalks. Sidewalks less than or equal to 20 feet are allowed to match the existing sidewalk width. For sidewalks greater than 20 feet length, the width should match requirements of IDM. Also, instructions added for detectable warning surfaces. Detectable warning surfaces shall be used where sidewalk intersects type C driveways that are stop, yield, or traffic signal controlled, or sidewalk slope is greater than 1 to 20. Uh, sorry. Uh, or, do, uh, or where the sidewalk slope is greater than 1 to 20 and intersects a type C driveway. Detectable warning plates are optional for sidewalks intersecti intersecting type A and type B driveways. On drawing uh, 2754-02, which is driveways with culverts on open ditch type streets, the valley gutter detail was removed since valley gutters are not allowed. Also, a section and detail were added to communicate the requirements for driveways on open ditch more clearly. On drawing 02775-08, sidewalks and clear zone transit corridor street. Detail, this drawing was modified to show walkable places, transit-oriented developments requirements, and IDM Chapter 17 latest requirements. 
drawings 1554-01 and 2, which are general notes for gra and ground mounting sign. These two drawings were revised for connection bolt size and details for mounting signs. The bolt sizes uh, have a little bit modified on these drawings. Also drawing 1554-04, uh, which is for custom signs. New bike signs were added to conduct requirements of chapter 17. Uh, on drawing 1555-01 through 12, uh, which are our uh, temporary uh, or TCP standard details. Uh, Waterfield barrier requirements added to general notes. Mounted signs uh, on type 3 barricades are no longer allowed. TCP details were updated to show this limitation. Stopping site distance table added to clarify the flagger location based on posted speed. And notes were added in alignment with changes made to TCP drawings. On uh, 025, 82-02 and 3, uh, which are traffic signal structures drawings, the anchor bolt thread length revised from 12 inch to 9 inch, also to be consistent in traffic signal foundation details and related specification, a statement added to anchor bolt detail to clarify that the bolt should be galvanized in its entire length. Drawing 02760-04, which is a standard pavement marking symbols. A new bicycle pavement marking symbol, symbols were added. On drawing 02760-09, bicycle lane pavement markings. In this drawing, Bicycle lanes were modified to align with requirements of different kinds of bicycle lanes in Chapter 17. And then in drawing 02760-10, which is bicycle intersection treatments, uh, graphics were updated to show acceptable cross sections according to Chapter 17. R3 and hardscape standard details were updated to conduct requirements of tree and plant protection specifications more clearly to the community. Another update to standard detail was that we continued separating continued standard com uh, combined standard details. Some engineers used to crop the standard details that was used in their projects to save space. However, this resulted in removing standard detail title block and effective date, which is not desired by the city. To avoid this issue, we divided the combined standard details into separate details. Now all categories of standard details except stormwater details are separated. Stormwater details will be updated through the current review cycle year. Uh, the next part, the, on this part, I'm going to talk about the standard details on our web page. You can find standard details on City of Houston Permitting Center website, Design and Construction Standards web page. You can see the web page address here in this slide, the top part. Our web page structure is now changed to provide a more user friendly environment for community. All details are now moved to one location under standard details tab, except stormwater details, which will be updated and moved in the current review cycle. Drop down lists are created for each category under which you can find PDF and DWG format of each standard detail. We have started to release DWG format of standard details and will continuously add them to the website as we update the graphic requirements according to Chapter 3 of IDM. Standard details on our web page again. Since several details are renumbered or retitled, a list of standard details is provided to avoid confusion. 
This list can be used as a guide for community to access their desired standard detail easily. This list is searchable and changes in number, title, or effective date are bolded. And this list will be updated each year to show the standard details title and number changes if there are any. Uh, the last part I'm going to talk about is uh, the standard details title blocks. So as I mentioned in previous slides, we have started releasing DWG format of standard details on design and construction standards website. Standard details title blocks are extracted into the DWG format of standard details and can be downloaded from our website. Um, since project specific modifications to city standard details are allowed, we strongly recommend engineers to review the modifications to standard details section of chapter three of IDM before using DWG format and modifying our standard details. Uh, this concludes the standard detail presentation. If you have any questions, please submit them through the chat. Thank you, Sahar. Before answering questions from the attendees, I'm going to ask you a few frequently asked questions. One question is, should Mylar submittals for capital improvement projects include the 2023 standard details? Um, the 2023 standard details are effective as of November 27th. Phase two final design projects that already have been submitted prior to November 27th of 2023 should incorporate the new changes to the extent that it does not increase costs or delay a project. Next question is, what is the reason for renumbering slash renaming the standard details? How can I find the renumbered slash renamed detail? So the details were renumbered to match with the associated standard specification. Uh, the review cycle committee believes that the, in the long run, it will help engineers and contractors to easily find the technical requirements for each standard detail in the associated specification. So as I explained in my presentation, we have provided a list of standard details, which include both the old number or title and new number or title on the design and construction standards web page. So uh, we hope that this will help the community to find their desired drawings easily. Next is, why is the DWG format not available for all standard details? Um, we released the DWG format of standard details that were under review in this review cycle. So we want to make sure that the DWG format follows the graphic requirements of Chapter 3. As we move forward, we will update and release the remaining details in the upcoming years. The last frequently asked question is, I have downloaded the DWG format of the standard detail. How do I know which size title block I should use? Um, in the DWG file, the layout tab is named per size of the detail. For example, if the layout is named 11 by 17, it means that the 11 by 17 title block should be used. Thank you, Sahar. I will take a look into the um, public questions now and see if there are any for you to answer. OK. OK, we have a question here. Are there any replacement drawings for the retired sign drawings? Uh, uh, I believe that uh, people can use uh, drawing 1582-01, uh, which is one of our uh, uh, edited drawings this year, uh, and they can use them on the Build Houston Forward uh, projects. We have another question here, Sahar. Are there plans to update the waterline standard details? If so, when will those updates be made slash done? Uh, of course, each year uh, that we have that, uh, you know, that uh, chapter of IDM to be reviewed, 
uh, we will review the drawings associated with that chapter. So they have to wait until that chapter uh, be reviewed, the year that uh, that chapter is being reviewed comes, and then in that year we will review both chapter and if uh, the updates needed for that for the details uh, for water, uh, we will update those ones as well. Okay. Next question is, are there other slides in the presentation available for printing or review later? Uh, sure, of course. So we will update uh, the present. Uh, we will upload the presentation slides on our uh, design and construction standards website uh, shortly. Also, we will upload uh, a set of uh, question and answer uh, document so people can uh, reach out to that uh, document and search for the you know ask questions during this webinar another question is can these details be opened online instead of requiring download every time it will be help it will help additional clicking uh, thank you for bringing out that question uh, I will talk and discuss this with our uh, 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 with our uh, webmaster section. Uh, if it is possible, we will do that. And the last question I have here, Sahar, is the traffic signal general notes detail is not included in the new details. Has this page been eliminated from the details? Uh, we have to look over it. Uh, the, uh, I will check and if there was a change, uh, I will let you know in the question and answer document later later on and if uh, there was an issue and there was a mistake we will upload that drawing thank you sahar for answering those questions next we have miss mary foster from the office of city engineer design and construction standards will take over the next part of this presentation thank you jose we're now at the closing of the webinar To recap from the beginning of the webinar, November 27, 2023 is the effective date of the new design criteria. For private public sector projects, you must submit substantially complete plans prior to that deadline to be grandfathered under the 2022 requirements. For additional background, refer to the 2023 IDM announcement and IDM executive summary. The IDM summary is provided at the beginning of the IDM document and gives implementation information for the IDM, standard specifications, and standard details. Before we proceed to the final Q&A, I'd like to discuss the current 2023-2024 review cycle. August was the beginning of the new review cycle. The 2023-2024 review cycle covers Chapter 9 along with its related specifications and standard details. This year's open comment period was from August 1st, 2023 through October 31st, 2023. Both the public and city employees were able to comment. The 2024 IDM publication is estimated to be on October 1st, 2024. And now I'll open it up to additional questions. Please type them in the chat. Thank you, Mary. So let's answer a few frequently asked questions first before answering questions from attendees. So one of the main questions is that, what if my project is originally submitted before the new IDM changes? and I would like to take advantage of the new storm changes. Uh, what is the process? The applicant should cancel the original project and submit a new project. The new project must comply with all 2023 IDM requirements. Uh, revisions may be accepted in lieu of cancellations if specific criteria is met, and this criteria will be posted in an announcement on the HPC website shortly. Thank you. The next question is, uh, what is the difference between this uh, COH IDM and COH Code of Ordinances? 
uh, where it should be applied and are they interchangeable? Okay. They are two different documents. The Code of Ordinances is approved by City Council, whereas the IDM consists of design requirements that are approved by the City Engineer and the Director of Public Works. There may be some overlap between the two. Our goal in the Design and Construction Standards team is to refer to the ordinance instead of spelling out those requirements if they're in the IDM. That way we don't have a disagreement. The Code of Ordinance could be considered a city law where the IDM is a set of design requirements and they should not conflict with each other. Thank you. Uh, is there a variance process to IDM? For privately publicly funded projects as defined in the IDM, variances shall be submitted to the Office of the City Engineer. You can find the IDM variance request forms for both city funded and privately funded projects on the Houston Permitting uh, Center website. For design contracts with the city, you have to follow a different process through the Capital Project Service Line. Thank you. Um, can public request off cycle changes to the standards? We don't address requests for changes from the public for standards that aren't up for review for the year. Uh, we do, however, make exceptions for public health and safety in which we would forward that request to the appropriate service line for guidance. Thank you. Another one. Uh, do you maintain the guide specifications in HPC's website? Where do we find details of every guide specification? Yes, the design and construction standards team does not maintain guide specifications. Uh, the guide specifications are maintained by the individual service lines, um, usually by capital projects. Uh, we can help them by providing a table of contents on our website to inform public of the guide specifications that are available. Thank you. So let me check the uh, Q&A for the public ask questions. Uh, one question is, is there uh, going to be a training credit for attending today? Uh, no, we are not offering any uh, PDH certificates. Thank you. Another question is that, will this PowerPoint presentation be available and was this webinar recorded? The answer is think, yes to both. Yeah. OK, thank you. Another question I think is from chapter 15. Uh, Ian, uh, I would appreciate if you could answer this one. Is the traffic and design studies portion of chapter 15 intended to provide guidelines for the traffic portion of DCR studies? That is an excellent question, and I wish I could have touched on it more. That That is the intention. Um, our design concept report is basically how we are handling the um, uh, aligning early project design standards. And um, and so that is a whole process into, in and of itself. And, and so we're this this the traffic design studies of chapter 15 is is hopefully will it feed into that seamlessly. And I would I would support that it, it could be used for that purpose. Yes. Thank you. Another question for chapter 15. So uh, does chapter 15 have a module that requires new construction share bike lanes added to show that they are not having negative impact on storm drains? Uh, example proof that uh, they are not blocking storm inlets. Did you ask that again? Uh, it says does chapter 15 have a module that requires new construction share bike lanes added to show that? Uh, I mean, the question ends here and then they've, there is an, a more explanation after that. Uh, more explanation is share bike lanes added to show that they are not having negative impact on storm drains. I'm going to have to read into that a little, little bit. Um, if okay. I get this wrong, feel free to answer, uh, ask again or ask and we'll answer it offline. Um, I, I think that the question might be um, asking about making sure that the bike facilities that we're building are not impacting storm drainage negatively. Great, Great. yes. And Thank that, you. That, is, that is the intention. Um, we do have a lot of guidelines. We've worked with our storm drainage team um, to, to really give guidance for how to minimize impacts. 
and, and so we would like to, we, we, the hope is that anything we build will be minimizing any impact and hopefully making stormwater better. Thank you, Ian. Another question for Chapter 15. Uh, have specific areas been identified for more than 1 to 2 percent growth due to high density development? We have not specifically identified those areas. We also have not necessarily specifically seen that to be related to a growth in traffic that you that you would expect, like in a suburban growth area, uh, largely because I think a lot of the high urban density that we're seeing actually has a lot of internal capture for the development or pass by trips. Some of the other tools for uh, trip generation and TIA process. Um, a lot of people are walking and biking using transit in those situations too. However, we're open to, to looking at those case by case. And if there's local data that shows that a particular area is having a higher growth rate than one to 2%, um, we are absolutely open to that. Thank you. Uh, there's another question for chapter 15 that I think uh, Mazen can help us answering this question. Uh, how do we know if we are uh, 1500 feet from a fiber optic cable? Is there a map? Yeah, Sahara, there is a um, fiber optic cable network map that we have. We can uh, we can share that with the uh, design engineers or during the review uh, that we conduct, we can point that out to the design engineer as well. Thank you so much. Another question. Uh, will this fiber cable uh, extensions at new intersections be required in ETJ areas? No, we're just concentrating now uh, on the uh, city of Houston limit. We, we, we're we not asking for those uh, requirements to be applied to the ETJ area yet. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, regarding LPI requirements. Is there a list available for transit oriented streets? Uh, I don't uh, Go ahead. I don't think we have a list available, but uh, you know, for safety reasons and safety measures, I guess the question is: is the LPI and the LBI will be applied to streets where we have a transit buses going? The answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. I think uh, for chapter seventeen. So, how can we measure project safety from existing and proposed conditions? I'm not sure if this is chapter 17 or 15. It probably touches on both. Uh, we have a little bit of guidance on our safety analyses that we're looking for in chapter 15 as part of the uh, uh, out of the design study section. That's one of our particular modules. Uh, we can use that for, um, and basically the process that we use is to look at text Chris data and, and to look at the time period beforehand. And, and we're kind of learning how to do these before and after um, analyses, but generally speaking, we like to wait at least six months after project completion to begin measuring crash rates because we, we understand that um, um, crash rates uh, have, have take a while for people to get used to new roadway conditions. Um, so I think we have a little bit of guidance in Chapter 15 and, and we'll probably be coming out with more guidance as, as we do more and more of these. Thank you. Mm. Um, I think you are good right now. OK. So I believe these are all the questions uh, we can answer at this time. Uh, I'll give it back to Mary. To continue. Thank you, Sahar. Uh, we've now reached the end of the webinar. If you have additional questions, feel free to send them to the Design and Construction Standards inbox. We will be posting a recording of this webinar a few days after this event. Go to our website, use the IDM tab, and scroll down to the video links. Again, you can find our website. The link is here, but you can also find it by Googling City of Houston uh, Design and Construction Standards. Now, all of these, the slides and the Q&A and the webinar recording itself will be posted under the IDM webinar heading. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope this was informative and take care. We hope to see you again next year. <laughs>